Your roots go a long way back, two and a half thousand years before Christ was born. 26 foot tall and still growing, you are the oldest living thing on earth. Rock solid and transfixed, you have taken life slowly, unlike our human race. That's us down there, Las Vegas glowing in the desert. Are you sad? Are you jealous? If you could speak, what would you tell us? Once you had a Garden of Eden, now you have this. A playpen in the desert, bliss. Here, 5,000 years of civilization can be experienced in an instant. Have a nice day. Enjoy, for in a flash, it could all be over. Kings, emperors, deities, craven images cast in plaster, neon lit. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. The smell of money in the air, a tawdry son et lumière. Mortals are mortal, they were once flesh and blood. Escape the delusion, the noise and pollution. The true immortals are made out of wood. They call us bristlecone pines. They call me Methuselah. You live 11,000 feet up in the White Mountains of California, where the climate is so harsh, little else can survive. It's no surprise you look more dead than alive. Adversity is the secret of your success. Shunning lush meadows for naked rock, you have taught yourself to thrive in this parched landscape with little food or water. Like wartime children brought up on a meagre diet, you far outlive your vigorous cousins further down the mountain. Your scrawny bodies atrophy on the outside while preserving a hidden vitality within. You survive on a lifeline only 10 inches wide, a strip of bark-covered tissue which manages to carry all essential nutrients from your roots to your needles. The slow pace of life keeps you slim. We humans could take a leaf out of your frugal lives. It takes a 100 years to add an inch to your waistline. Could it be that deep within your cells you hold the key to immortality? Your secrets seem safe in this rocky wilderness until one day in 1957, a scientist walked into your life. The scientist's name was Edmund Schulman, and he was about to make the most exciting discovery of his life. In the cross-section he removed from your body, he counted over 4,600 rings, 
each representing exactly one year of life. By inspecting the width of each ring, he could tell what kind of a year you'd had and whether the climate had promoted growth. Hidden within your trunk was a record of weather and time of unparalleled age and accuracy. Schulman was the first to bring precision to the use of tree rings as dating instruments and climate recorders. Bristle cones were 1,500 years older than any other tree previously studied. Having found the oldest tree of all, he named you Methuselah. Methuselah, Methuselah, this shulman christens me, for he has counted the candles on my cake, 4,600. Am celebrity now, and no mistake, am named am given voice. The years, like necklaces, bestow a wisdom shulmankind will never know. Millennia, they come and go, have no eyes but have seen it all. Ancient civilizations that you can only read about, Methuselah has sensed. Am not part of history. No, history is parts of me. Our 2566 BC. Not long after you'd taken root, the largest stone building in the world is about to be occupied. King Cheops had built the Great Pyramid of Giza as a tomb for himself. He is lying on his deathbed. exhales for the last time. His breath contains millions of carbon dioxide molecules. Imagine those molecules of spent breath cast adrift into the atmosphere, riding the jet stream, crossing oceans and continents. A few reach a land that would later be called America. Perhaps you were too young to remember. You were a mere sapling when one entered your body through a tiny paw on the tip of a needle. <laughs> Drawing energy from the sun, you split these molecules asunder. The oxygen is for us, the carbon for you. Your complex chemistry bonds the carbon atoms into sugar that fuels your growth. And that's how a molecule from a dying breath can give life to one of your new cells. When King Cheops died, you were nine inches tall and only 77 years old. During your first thousand years, civilizations and the world beyond come and go. Then one day, you had your first encounter with humanity. These hunters were Paiute Indians who for 3,000 years followed longhorn sheep into the White Mountains, leaving behind evidence of their brief visits. You getting much over there? 
Not much, just a few flakes. Oh, here we go. Well, this is a, a naturally occurring volcanic glass, obsidian, uh, that's extremely abundant in this part of the world. This is a, a volcanically active part of the world. Uh, it's very easy to work uh, and produces extremely sharp edges. Um, it's uh, wonderful for us as well because it can be sourced to particular flows and so we can use it to uh, understand where people are coming from and where they went. Uh, we can reconstruct in, in quite a bit of detail the annual rounds of people at different times in the past by looking at the sources of obsidian that they, they collected and used. From the location of the obsidian lava flows, archaeologists have established that the Indians would cover a distance of 150 miles in the course of a year. In the six weeks of summer, when the weather opened up the mountain tops for hunting, they would venture up to your domain. Small groups, uh, probably mostly hunters, uh, would come up to these highlands, uh, hunt for a period of maybe a few days or a week, uh, try and, and, and get some meat, uh, maybe even dry it or partially dry it, and then return down to the, the valleys where living conditions were a little better. This is an extremely harsh environment. It freezes almost every night here, even during the middle of the summer. The air is thin, uh, the wind is, is, is incessant. It is not a comfortable place to be. Uh, here it is, the, the middle of, of July, and I'm wearing a, a down vest to give you some idea of, of just how harsh conditions are. One summer, it was so cold that it left you scarred for life. The few cells that grew that year were damaged when the water inside froze up, expanded and burst the cell walls. When the tree rings were examined under a microscope, the jagged black line clearly showed cell death in the year 1628 BC. What could have caused temperatures in that year to fall so dramatically? Could that frozen ring be a record of some cataclysmic event in another part of the world? Unlike words, tree rings never lie. One year was freezing cold and dark. The sun was hidden in the sky. I tasted brimstone, and it left its mark like a noose tightening like a charred wreath. What is this thing, I thought, called death? That acid taste of death came from a distant island in the Aegean Sea. The eruption of the volcano on Santorini was probably the biggest bang in history. Its devastating effects are thought to have wiped out the Minoan civilization of Crete. The exact date has always been in dispute. Could a tree 7,000 miles away provide the answer? Scientists now think that the volcano shot a plume of ash into the stratosphere, which spread as far as China and North America. The thick veil of dust blocked the sun, causing temperatures to plummet. And that's how your frozen tree ring told us the story of 1628 BC. You can read me like a book. Open me up and take a look. History laid bare, a garland here, a crown there, plain as a pikestaff for all to see, each year jotted down by me, the state of the nation, an annual report in ever-decreasing circles, the wheels of fortune, the cycles of despair. The Santorini Frost Ring made people realize that tree rings could date events in antiquity with incredible precision. But since the early 1960s, a group of tree scientists have been frustrated by the limitations imposed on their art by the age of the oldest living tree. They wanted a dating instrument that would go back much further. This man, Tom Harlan, spends his time combing groves for pieces of dead bristlecone that may be even older than you. 
by taking cores and sections out of logs and dead trees, we can overlap our record and go further back in time. So here we have living trees just very close to 5,000 years old, but by use, utilizing the logs and snags and what we call remnants, just the fragments of wood that are lying on the ground, we go back to the year 6,700 BC or 8,700 years ago as a continuous record. His technique is to slide together sequences of rings from wood of different ages until they line up. By 1969, the world had its first unbroken dating record, going back nearly 9,000 years. It was a perfect reference which could be used to check other dating systems. It arrived at a time when the complicated chemistry of carbon dating was found to be flawed. Carbon dating depended for its accuracy on there being a constant level of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere. However, in the 1960s, this was found not to be the case. Bristle cones came to the rescue. Scientists took wood of a known date and then subjected it to radiocarbon dating to see how far out it was. They discovered that it could be out by as much as a thousand years. Archaeology was turned on its head. Dates always assumed to be right were wrong. The leading theory of how European history evolved had to be revised. You see, we had all believed that the influence of the Eastern Mediterranean had radiated outwards to the barbaric north. We had thought Stonehenge was inspired by the sophisticated Mycenaeans of Greece. In fact, it turned out that Stonehenge was built long before. That's why you and your kin are known as the trees that rewrote history. While Europe was sliding into its dark age, you were entering middle age. When you were three and a half thousand years old, you may recall a great change in the White Mountains. The nomadic Paiute Indian hunters began putting down roots of their own. About 1,300 years ago, uh, so five, six hundred years after the birth of Christ, we start to see a very different pattern where uh, entire families or households uh, would move up here to the highlands for many weeks or even a, a couple of months in the summer, and they spent a long time up here exploiting the environment much more intensively uh, than they had during that earlier hunting pattern. Uh, and that suggests to us that, that things in the lowlands, uh, where living conditions are generally a little easier in one sense, it's certainly uh, warmer, um, must have been pushed, pushed to the point where all of a sudden these uplands became more worthwhile to exploit more intensively. The rising population forced families to move up to 12,000 feet where they established the highest settlements in America. In most instances, we would have probably seen one, two, three families inhabiting one of these villages in any particular uh, summer. Uh, women probably would have spent a lot of their time collecting roots uh, like bitterroot, Louisia, um, and also the seeds of a lot of these grasses. It's, it's hard to imagine when you look at them, the seeds are so tiny, uh, but those two were collected uh, and eaten while men probably would have spent most of their time uh, hunting in more distant areas uh, for mountain sheep. Yet none of us working in this area, doing archaeology in this area, uh, had any suspicion until, oh, about 12, 13 years ago uh, that people lived in, this, in these harsh uplands, uh, in these kinds of settled permanent villages. We always suspected that a little bit of hunting would have been, would have been going on up here in the summer months, but we had no notion uh, that this kind of intensive village occupation was occurring. 
Methuselah might have been a little bit worried at times as he watched people starting to use some of these ancient trees and ancient timber to build these houses, uh, to stoke their fires, um, to build hunting fences and that sort of thing. So maybe even a, a little bit of anxiety. Anxiety was soon to turn to terror, not only for you, Methuselah, but also for the Indians. The white man was coming. The white immigrant took his time getting to California. By the 1860s, the canyons around you were echoing to the sounds of rocks being crushed and sifted. Prospectors were searching for silver and gold. Some continue to this day. Alan Aitken has been working these hills for 40 years. He barely makes enough to pay his way. There's knowledge and skill involved in prospecting, but there's always that element of chance. Since you can't really see underground, there's a, it could nevertheless fail. And, and no matter how uh, poor something is, there is at least some possibility that it could turn out to be something great. So uh, honestly, I'm sure I, I've spent a lot more than I've ever made, but I, I still have hope. There, there's always the, the odds that, that in enough time, you're, it's bound to pay off for you, you know? Whether it'll pay you back for all the time you spent at it is very <laughs> doubtful, but, <laughs> but if you spend enough time at it, sooner or later you'll bound to find something good. If one prospector hit pay dirt, thousands of others followed. Each time a seam of silver or gold was struck, they swarmed all over the mountain, staking their claim, greed being the human curse. The richest silver mine was called Cerro Gordo. In 1870, it supported a town of nearly 5,000 people, a wild and lawless place. Hollywood actress Jodie Stewart still lives in this ghost town. This was an extremely violent town. There was a murder a week in Cerro Gordo. There are 600 people buried up on the hillside. The hanging tree is laying down canyon. We have one building, the Belshaw House, that has 156 bullet holes in the living room floor. And Jodie knows how they got there. Dance. <laughs> At night, you would hear a little dance hall music and some gunfire, and uh, you would hear uh, rock hammers and drills uh, striking into the hard rock, and probably an occasional black powder explosion as somebody shot around. Uh, the atmosphere here was fairly Dante-esque. At first, it was, uh, I think, a, a small mining camp, but then uh, with investment came the large smelters. I've uh, read accounts where they called Cerro Gordo, which means Fat Hill, they called it Old Smoky 
The smelters were belching smoke 24 hours a day. There were at least two large ones that were burning uh, several cords a day, I guess probably maybe 10, 12 cords a day. If I had lungs, I would be coughing. A throat, I would be parched. If I had eyes, they would be stinging. Flesh, it would be scorched. Sulfur, smoke, and cinders enfold me like a shroud. There is no silver lining, only poison in this cloud. The smoke was a byproduct of the extraction of molten silver from the ore. At its height, the mine yielded 2,000 tons of silver a year. Freighting silver bars was always a problem. And at one time, the production from the hill was so great that between 18 and 30,000 of these 83 pound bars stacked up waiting uh, shipment by wagon. And the uh, workers were stacking the bars like bricks and stretching canvas over the top and living in them. And so they were really living in silver houses. But success for the human spelled disaster for the bristle cone. Wood was needed to fuel the smelters, to shore up mine shafts, and to build houses. For miles around you, the hills were stripped bare. The air filled with the silent chemical screams of dying trees. Your defenses were triggered. When bristle cone skin is broken, the needles release evil smelling chemicals called terpenoids. These are highly effective against insect attack, but are useless against axes and saws. were not the only victims. The Paiute Indians suffered a similar fate. Ranchers moved cattle into the valleys to feed the miners. The cattle ate the grass seeds that formed part of the Indian staple diet, and the miners hunted the longhorn sheep almost to extinction. The Indian way of life could no longer be sustained. Toyo, toyo, the Paiute Indians, who had lived alongside you for over a thousand years, were swept from the valleys within half a decade. Yet these mining towns were never more than a flash in the pan. The town of Rhyolite boomed for seven years, boasting banks, swimming pools, and even an opera house. Then, when the silver ran out, the town went bust, and the desert reclaimed the streets. The metal that drove men mad is bad for you, too. When your roots reach out in search of water and nutrients, they absorb dissolved silver. But you've learned how to deal with this poison by filtering out the silver molecules and depositing them inside your cells. When your cells get older and die, resin surrounds them, sealing the toxic contents forever within your trunk. The problem for you, Methuselah, isn't silver, but water. You live in one of the driest places on Earth. You can only quench your thirst during the six weeks of the year when the winter snow melts around your roots. You've adapted well to your limited supply. Why waste energy on frivolous growth when one set of needles can last 40 years? The design of your needles minimizes water loss. Specially recessed pores 
ensure that no precious moisture is lost. The pores remain shut most of the time, unlike those of other trees, which use and lose gallons a day. In the desert, every drop of water counts, except, it seems, in Las Vegas. Water, water everywhere and not a drop. To think that down there, battery trees, like plumped up turkeys, stand proud and vain, bloated and unaware that they are but a switch's throw away from death. Water, water, not forever. For 24 hours a day, fountains play, spraying graffiti that mocks a desert kept at bay. How profligate we must seem to you when a golf course consumes a million gallons a day, whereas you can get by on a hundred gallons a year. In Las Vegas, humans regard the conspicuous display of water as a sign of luxury. One hotel has 200 foot high fountains. There's even a fake Lake Como. Though they live on the driest spot in America, Las Vegans use more water than anyone else in the world, a staggering 300 gallons per person per day. Las Vegas is booming. It's the fastest growing city in America. Each year, 60,000 people move here, and 15,000 new houses are built. Street maps are out of date, even before they're printed. What you see before you is a display of human power over nature. But nature has a way of saying enough. After the pride, there comes the fall. After the boom, the bust. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust. Sixty miles from Las Vegas was a town specifically designed to boom and bust. They called it Doomtown. So, Methuselah, you survived the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, even the Machine Age. But how did you fare in the Nuclear Age? We were on the brink of the apocalypse the culmination of half a century of human tinkering with the nature of matter.
1957 was a strange year. Whilst Edmund Schulman and his colleagues were collecting data from the bristle cones around you, a hundred miles away, the atom bomb was being tested in the desert below. These bomb tests would come off early in the morning and uh, a number of people would walk up to a height where we could see the flash of the bomb. And uh, when I look back on it now, it was remarkable how we were just sort of almost oblivious to the uh, uh, to anything like radioactive fallout. It was a big event. And, uh, and there was a shock. I mean, we'd see the glow and the earth would shake. It, I mean, we, it was like a definite boom. It was something almost of a lark then to just see this, I mean, the, just this uh, manifestation of what the human being could do. It was a scientific achievement. A hundred and thirty miles east of this achievement was a Mormon town called St. George. It lay directly downwind of the bomb. Agatha Mannering was in her garden and was given no warning of what was to come. She became a human guinea pig. When that went off, I was lifted off the ground. It, it just came and hit me up through my feet. When I could see this grey cloud rolling in, just rolling in, and I just stood there and watched it. If I'd have had any sense, I would have run and hid in the closet or something. But uh, this cloud just rolled in there, and I stood there, and, and I smelled it. It had a horrible, nasty smell. I began to feel bad, and my throat began to burn. My sinuses began to burn, and my head became prickly, like ants was stinging the top of my head. But now I always would bathe. But this night I felt too bad to. That's the first time I can remember of feeling so bad I didn't want to even bother bathing. And that's the one time in my life I needed to. And I've had a pile of cancers over my face and body. Now I'm a genealogist and I know what my forefathers died from way back. And none of them ever had cancer. Uh, but all of this generation has had cancer. You know, the, so many of the people died. There was one or two blocks in St. George that there wasn't a house on that block but what someone died of cancer. You were lucky to be upwind of the test site. That's how you escaped so lightly with only a trace of strontium-90 in your rings. But for scientists like Edmund Schulman, the 1950s remained a golden age of innocence and aspiration. He spent three glorious summers in bristlecone country, coring a thousand trees. His aim was to construct a complete weather record of Western America. He was your greatest fan and never ceased to marvel at your triumph over adversity. Struggling with a failing heart in the thin air of the mountains, he came to wonder, almost fancifully, if trees like you held the secret of living forever. He was facing his own mortality and uh, obviously had difficulty with breathing and all, and uh, this is why I was working with him. And so uh, one uh, <clears throat> surprising a bit of conversation, which came up several times in the several weeks that I was with him, is that he would say that somehow he would hope that he used the term elixir, that some substance could be distilled from these old trees that the human being could somehow absorb and then would be a factor in longevity in the human beings, that the tree could impart its adaptation to adversity to the human being. It seemed to me out of place with the rest of his work. Here he was the very careful scientific method of uh, this extreme care in counting rings, analyzing everything that he said here, and then branching off into this other, it struck me as a, that definitely that he had left the science behind. Ironically, 
In attributing bristle cones with such supernatural qualities, Schumann may have been closer to the truth than he realized. In 1972, we came up and visited the Schulman Grove here, and we walked down and saw Methuselah and noticed that it had a single cone on it. So it suddenly struck us that it would be interesting to find out if a tree that ancient, a tree that was almost 5,000 years old, would be able to produce viable seedlings, viable seeds. So we made arrangement to collect the single cone and we extracted the seed. There were 96 seeds and we planted the seeds in our nursery. We got 100% germination, which for us was absolutely astounding. And they were all healthy seedlings also. The genetic material contained within your seeds is perfectly preserved. Our cells are programmed to die. Yours seem to go on forever. When scientists compared your tissue with much younger bristle cones, they found no signs of deterioration, despite the 4,000-year age difference. It was very unusual. It was astounding to us because there's no indication that there's a built-in uh, senility to the tree. Methuselah could live forever. There's, there's no indication that uh, it can't. It's very robust sexually, and it seems to be growing healthily, although very slowly. And each year it puts on an increment of growth, both height and diameter, but uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly healthy, vigorous tree. So, at least theoretically, Methuselah could live forever. What's your secret? Is it your Spartan existence? A slow metabolism guaranteeing your place in the Never Never Land? Perhaps one day by studying your most personal chemistry, scientists may unravel the elixir of life. In 1958, the man who became so intrigued by your longevity succumbed to human frailty. And now, dearly beloved, let us sing Amazing Grace. Schulman died at the age of 49. memorial service was held in the shadow of your branches. Since then, other scientists working with bristle cones have died prematurely. Is this a curse, Methuselah? Revenge for Schulman's final gift to the world. He wrote an article for the National Geographic magazine celebrating the bristle cone so that others could share the wonder of these trees. But his gesture backfired. Tourists swarmed up the mountains to try and find you. They marvelled at the idea of the oldest of living things. In fact, they liked you so much they tore bits off for souvenirs. Others were driven by more serious intent. When I was starting graduate school, my mother sent me an issue of the National Geographic that had uh, a major article in it by Edmund Schulman, and this was fascinating. I'd never heard of bristlecone pine, and uh, so I was on the lookout for them, and I began to see them uh, as I was doing some graduate research uh, in the Rocky Mountains and then uh, out into the Great Basin. Uh, bristlecone pines are out there and it was uh, a kind of a sense of discovery. Wow, here's another mountain range with bristlecone pines. I wonder how old they are. I wonder what they can tell us. Don Curry was a geography student, and the article made him realize that bristle cones might help him date glacial deposits in Nevada. On the crest of a glacial moraine, a particularly old and grizzled specimen caught his eye. By pure chance, he'd chosen a tree that would turn out to be even older than you. But he was faced with a problem. The normal approach to coring the tree uh, wasn't 
working because the largest available increment bores were uh, too small to core, even from several angles. Not having the experience to know what to do next, Curry took a more direct course of action. So we uh, cut the tree down and uh, captured from the tree a thick cross section, about a foot thick. He took the slab back to his motel room and started to count the rings. We could begin to see that we were getting over 4,000 years over 4,500, over 4,600, which was the oldest record that had been reported in the literature up until that time, and we ended around 4,900 years. And you've got to think, I've got to have done something wrong. I better recount, I better recount again. I better look really carefully with higher magnification. It was only then that the full horror of what he had done began to dawn on him. He had discovered the world's oldest living thing and killed it. Fate had dealt a cruel blow. The tree that ended up being cut was literally the first old tree that we climbed to on the crest of the lateral moraine. Five minutes of looking is all that was involved. <laughs> Fate had one last hand to deal the victim of Curry's chainsaw. The slab was laid to rest in the casino of the small town it once looked down on. Men drop to the earth like leaves, lives as brief as footprints in snow. Bristle cones enthroned on top of the world watch civilizations come and go. They seek our secret immortality, but search in vain, for it is vanity. If truth be known, I would rather be a flower or a leaf that lives and breathes with brief intensity. My life is as thin as the wind, and I am done with counting stars. On the side of this mountain, I might live forever. Could you imagine anything worse? My name is Methuselah, and this is my curse. When Shulman died, he left quite a few samples that he never had a chance to examine. And a number of years after his death, I went through dating many of these samples, and I discovered that out on these slopes, there is a tree older than Methuselah. And in order to protect this tree, I am not telling anyone which tree it is. Anonymity is its absolute best defense.